Hello everybody, we are going to go through a hopefully brief, but probably not, uh, just to be fair, overview of uh, the basis of cancer or what we call neoplasia. And we'll break down some words and go through the learning objectives and learn the basics of uh, the development of a neoplastic growth. And then we'll go through the clinical application of those tools. Okay. So going forward, uh, the minimum learning objectives, which means if you know these things at the minimum, um, you are going to get a pretty average grade on the exam. Ideally, if you know everything that is included on the review sheet to read the chapter, you will know everything about neoplasia and do your A material. So first off, we'll talk about how the adaptive changes we've discussed in cellular injury um, are different or contribute to tissue growth uh, versus tumor growth. Uh, importantly, we're going to differentiate benign tumors from malignant tumors. We'll talk about metastasis, a very important uh, topic that malignant tumors have uh, in common with one another. Uh, benign tumors cannot metastasize, which is a very important uh, distinguishment. We'll talk about uh, the systemic effects of tumor formation, so specifically how they grow and how that affects the system and the way that they take advantage of uh, typical body processes and things like glucose and other things that we need to run our body. And the tumors take advantage of that and kind of suction them into themselves. At the end of the lecture, once we go through uh, the various types of cancers that are described in the second part of the lecture that will be posted. We'll talk about cancer therapeutics and treatments, uh, both the kind of historical uh, best known practices and the up and coming types of treatments, which are encouraging, interesting, and much different than the non-selective treatments that are currently in use. So here is your vocab list, which includes a lot of root words, and some of them we've already gone through, uh, and some are new, uh, like the word neo. So neo refers to something that is new, so a neoplasia, like in this chapter, uh, plasia is a growth. So we've talked about hyperplasia, uh, we haven't really talked about anaplasia, but it is something that there is a lack of growth. Uh, so we'll use that plasia a lot, which is associated with the word plasm. And I've described the root word of this. It's associated with a substance, um, more specifically, uh, something that you would mold, so making a sculpture of some sort. Uh, and in this case, something that is a growth or lesion will be a plasm. So a neoplasm is a new growth or a new substance. Whereas hyperplasia is, you know, excessive growth. Trophy um, comes from the word trophic with an IC at the end. Uh, when something is hypertrophic, it means that it is increasing in its size. So trophy is referring to size. Um, you'll also see that it's also associated with um, a general increase in function, which is an important thing we'll get to. Okay, whenever you see an OMA, uh, that is referring to a tumor. And if you remember the five cardinal signs of inflammation, the swelling, the redness, and loss of function, there's uh, Latin words associated with those things, like rubor is redness, dolor is pain, and tumor is referring to a swelling. So a tumor technically is a swelling. So if you think of a hematoma, for example, when blood fills up a tissue bed, um, that's referring not to like a malignant growth, but to an actual uh, substance that is accumulated in the body. So it's a swelling of some sort. Uh, static is something that refers to location. Uh, so when you're static, you're in one place. So the term stasis is referring to location. So metastatic, uh, meta is over here. Meta refers to change. We've already gone through metaplasia, which is a change in a substance when the tissue type converts to another one. So metastasis is a change in location. And that's, again, a very important cornerstone in cancer terminology. 
A before something means none. So anemia, which we've talked about, is like like no blood or lack of blood. Um, Ana is lack, like anaphylaxis. Um, hyper is excessive, and dis is bad or deranged. And we've talked about dysplasia, uh, which we refer to as precancerous, and we'll look at some precancerous or dysplastic lesions in this chapter as well. So these are here just for your own uh, knowledge, so that when you can put these words together, you'll understand uh, what we're talking about. Another important thing that we'll go through that I'll just add here are uh, the germ cell layers. So there's the ectoderm, the endoderm, the mesoderm, and those uh, germ cell layers are how cancers are characterized. So if something originates from um, like the mesoderm, which is typically something uh, muscular related, it has a specific name associated with it. So if you are generally familiar with those things, um, that will help you as well. So you'll be able to distinguish knowing these root words and then also the germ cell layers and what's derived from them, uh, what type of tumor you would expect. All right, so let's get into the basics of neoplasia. Uh, and in typical conversation, uh, you'll hear this referred to as cancer. And if you have looked at an astrology report before, you might know that cancer is the sign associated with a crab. So when uh, tumors were put under a high-powered uh, microscope, it was noted that they had these invasive crab claw-like extensions, which is why uh, they settled on the, the term cancer to describe these things. So cancers are a large group of diseases characterized by a few different things. The first is uncontrolled growth and spread of abnormal cells. And if you remember from another lecture, I think a cell injury, when a cell is highly abnormal, we call it a pleomorphic cell. So uncontrolled growth and spread of abnormal cells like pleomorphic cells. Uh, to proliferate means that they spread. So if somebody's a proliferative, <laughs> Blah, now I can't speak. Proliferative writer, it means that not only do they write a lot, but they write a lot of different types of things. So they have a large body of work. In the case of cells, rapid proliferation means that they're uh, copying themselves really quickly and they are doing so without taking into account the normal factors in the body that control that. And then finally is metastasis, and we'll take a look at this, um, but some tumors, uh, malignant tumors specifically, uh, just like in Spanish when you see mal before something, it means bad. So malignant tumor is the bad type of tumor uh, that people refer to as cancerous, and only malignant tumors have the ability to metastasize or change their location. And we'll take some looks at um, a video of this and then also some pictures uh, showing the spread of cancers. But when we talk about metastasis, it's not new tumors um, or new types of cancers popping up in the body. It's pieces of an initial tumor. Uh, we call that the primary tumor, which spreads to secondary sites in the body. And Sometimes there's multiple secondary sites, sometimes there's not, and we'll go through that. And that also goes through the naming mechanisms for the stages of cancer, which I will post a handout for you about. All right, so just looking at this picture, if we're looking at a benign illustration of a tumor versus a malignant, you can already see some differences before we even start to list them. So one important thing I want you to notice is that in a benign tumor, the cells resemble each other. So they're not normal cells in that area, but they do resemble that tissue type. And you'll see this when we get to the clinical pictures. When something is malignant, it doesn't look like it belongs on that tissue. Whereas a benign growth is really just an excessive growth of uh, cells that closely resemble that tissue type. And you can also see that they're organized and in rows the way that we would expect cells to align themselves. So we call that a stratification. These cells remain stratified or stacked in a normal way. 
very importantly, whenever you see illustrations like this uh, from this text, that's referring to fibrous tissue or scar tissue. As we talked about in the healing process, when there is uh, an injury, we need to clot uh, so that the blood doesn't leave the body. So we have the activation of the coagulation cascade, which leads to the development of fibrin. And fibrin is what makes up scar tissue, which makes areas in your body very strong. It's hard to pull fibrin apart. Uh, we call it uh, tensile strength, uh, which means the inability to be pulled apart. And the important part about this scar tissue, it's a casein, and what it does is prevent these cells from migrating. So they have to stay here and they have to stay as part of this growth. Um, they can continue to grow and proliferate and this tumor can enlarge, but uh, this fibrous coating is going to prevent those cells from shedding off. What you don't see in a malignant growth is that fibrous capsule. And that's important. That means that it can metastasize. It can move and it can um, start to colonize the local tissue. So I want you to notice these cells do not resemble each other, which means they don't resemble the tissue type. Uh, we can see that they're pleomorphic, so they have darkly stained nuclei. Their cytoplasmic to nuclei ratio is not normal. We can also see that some of these cells have... Um, kind of shed off. And that's normal of cancer cells. They have no uh, loyalty to this tumor. They will break off and move throughout the body when they're given a chance, which is how we get metastasis. You do see some scar tissue um, in these fibrin layers here, but what that does is allow malignant growths to grow larger. It provides mass or scaffolding for them to grow. So they do activate the fibrin cascade, but not um, in the form of a capsule forming. Instead, it just leads to malignant growths being immobile um, and hard when they're felt in places like under the skin. So typically when something is squishy and it moves around, it's probably okay. Um, it's probably benign. If it's hard and it's not mobile, that's something that you want to get uh, checked out always. Okay, so the way that neoplastic tissues are graded pathologically is how closely they resemble the tissue of origin. And just like I mentioned, benign growths, the cells are near normal size, their shape uh, an arrangement is relatively normal, they're stratified, where malignant growths, they are highly pleomorphic, abnormal nuclei. Uh, like you saw in this picture, there's some really large cells, and that means that those cells in mitosis, they fail to split. So they're, they're kind of arrested in this mitotic state. There's also a high mitotic rate of these cancerous cells, which means they can make copies of themselves, um, which look more and more abnormal each time they copy themselves. One other important thing about malignant cells in a neoplastic tissue is that they're immortal. So they never really die. Because remember, if they could die, um, they, would, they would undergo apoptosis. They would die and we wouldn't have a tumor and that'd be great. Instead, they don't really wear out. So they're what we call immortal cells, which is why uh, clinically there is some sort of um, intervention to try to prevent them from doing that. All right, so I have a couple of things here, so I'm just going to turn this on so you can see the animation quickly. Um, so a benign growth, Oops, okay, so well-differentiated cells, slow regular growth, they grow via expansion, which is kind of how we grow. So we can grow outwards, like the belly and the body can get bigger, um, but you don't break off a piece of yourself and start growing a little twin. Uh, that would be awesome, but we don't do that. But really importantly, they're encapsulated. Um, when they're encapsulated by this uh, benign, or sorry, fibrous outer layer, that means they can't invade the local tissues. They can't send out little invasive um, extensions to go below their tissue layer, and they don't metastasize. So here's a picture of a benign tumor, and it's right underneath the skin, and I want you to notice that this does not look that different from the rest of the dermal layers. 
it is encapsulated, which means that it cannot move. So that means it can't go up into the higher epidermal layers and it can't go down into the fatty layers or into the bone. When a tumor moves to another level of tissue, uh, we would say it has invaded that space. So this tumor can get bigger in this area, but it can never leave that area. It just exists where it is. When you do a pathologic stain and look at a piece of a tumor underneath a microscope to characterize it, uh, this is what you would see. And so what I want you to notice is this outer fibrous coating, which lets us know that that tumor is not going to move. So if you got this underneath your microscope, you would say that this is a benign growth. And you can see that the cells are pretty well arranged and they don't look that abnormal. All right, so this is what uh, a benign growth would look like in the skin area like I just showed you. So here's some normal kind of fatty tissue. It looks really gross, but what you see is a very well circumscribed benign growth here. Again, I want you to notice that it looks very similar to the native tissue. It's not bloody and red, which you will see with metastatic growth, but more importantly, it's encapsulated. So this is what the gross pathology would show, um, and the microscopic pathology would be stained to show this. And that's how uh, cancers are named, by uh, what those cells look like and what they look like underneath the microscope. So here's some examples of benign tumors, and your tip or trick of the day is that if you just see something with OMA at the end, and before that there is a word root for an area of the body, almost always that means it's a benign growth. And you always have to say almost always, especially in medicine, because medicine is what we say an art. Uh, and not a science. So there's always going to be exceptions to the rule. Like if you think of lymphoma, uh, there's no good like benign form of lymphoma. Um, so typically when you, so that's an exception to the rule. But in other cases, if you just see OMA with a word root in front of it, uh, it's telling you that's a benign growth. So adeno means a tissue or organ or gland. So adenoma are benign growths that grow from glandular epithelium. So here is a picture of a patient with a benign adenoma of a salivary gland. And you might know we've got parotid glands up here. There's submandibular glands, and then there's the sublingual. So this is likely a parotid type of growth. And you can see here, uh, this is the normal kind of outflow pathway that saliva would go through. And again, this is a typical benign growth. It resembles the tissue around it. And it might contain some pleomorphic cells. So this one was characterized as pleomorphic, meaning it was put underneath the microscope and pleomorphic cells were seen. Um, but generally, if you see adenoma, that's referring to tissue of a gland or an organ. Uh, the rule also with benign growth is that you don't you don't really intervene unless absolutely necessary. And we'll describe that in a little bit. Uh, but if it is affecting the quality of that person's life, so if you imagine you had a very large growth in the back of your throat, you had blockage of saliva, you might have difficulty swallowing, so that's something that affects the quality of life. So that would probably be addressed with some sort of surgical excision. You can't just drain it because it's benign growth. There's nothing to drain. It cells there. So that's something that would have to be removed if it was bothering the patient. Angio refers to a vessel, so an angioma is a, a benign growth of a blood vessel. So this is called a serenoangioma, which you see on the nose of this uh, young infant. And Cyrano comes from an old movie and story about a gentleman with a nose that resembled this. 
uh, which is not a very nice thing to call it, um, but that's what it's called. But generally, angioma, or uh, sometimes you'll see hemangioma, which is associated with blood as well. Um, so this is a benign growth. Again, this is something that would be removed only if it was affecting the life of that patient. So if there was difficulty breathing, uh, just a little note that all babies are born nose breathers. If a baby is breathing through their mouth, that typically means that there's something, um, not always serious, but something abnormal, which could be with the septum of the nose or the tonsils or the adenoids. Um, but they should be breathing through their nose. So if her breath uh, was obstructed in any way, then this would be something that was removed. But listen to me when I say this, uh, because there'll probably be a question about it. Um, when babies are born, if you've ever seen a kid before, uh, the average age or weight of a newborn uh, can be anywhere from six to eight pounds. And by the time they're three months old, they're at, you know, 10, 12 pounds. At six months, they're double <laughs> that almost. So what I want you to know is that those first like six months of life to a year of life is when children are doing the majority of their growing. Remember that we want to intervene only if absolutely necessary, if the comfort of the patient is affected or the health of the patient is affected. But we also have to take into account the age. So if this is someone younger than six months, we know it's just going to keep growing or it might slow down growing. So the approach here is what we call watchful waiting, meaning when this is first seen, you wouldn't say, all right, let's get rid of it. More commonly, it's, okay, let's see you back in a couple of weeks and check out the growth. And then there's an intervention um, at the time when growth starts to slow down. Okay, chondro is referring to cartilage. So a chondroma is a benign growth of cartilage. So here's a soft tissue chondroma, very well circumscribed, local, benign growth. Um, this was removed. You can imagine that if this was growing like in your meniscus between your knees, this would be causing you quite a bit of discomfort and affecting uh, the quality of life because you have to walk places like every day. So this is something that would be removed. We'll also look at polyps or papillomas, and pap, like papilla, is referring to um, like a triangle-shaped or pyramid-shaped object. Uh, papillae are located in places like the kidneys. We'll look at those in later chapters. The male penis has pap papilla on it. So papil or papilloma is a benign tumor of a papilla. Um, and then polyps are benign tumors that you'll see a lot in places like the cervix and the GI tract. What's different about a polyp is that there's a stalk associated with it. So it almost looks like a mushroom. There's a stalk and then there's a tumor at the top of it. And those arise from epithelial surfaces and they're very, very common. Um, and those are found in screening procedures depending on the location. So those are some examples of benign tumors. So remember if it's OMA at the end with just a stem in front of it, it's generally referring to a benign growth. Once they're removed, there's no risk and that should be great. Uh, do benign tumors become malignant? They do not. There's one type of tissue and they remain that type of tissue. Okay, now going on to malignant growths. So malignant tumors undifferentiated cells. So when you think about the mitosis process, uh, the cells split into two identical daughter cells. They're identical to the parent cell and to each other. And then they go through a growth cascade until they eventually look like the cell that they're supposed to be. So skin cells uh, look like skin cells. So they go through that pathway so that they're differentiated. So undifferentiated means that they didn't make it through that process at some point. So they don't look like the parent tissue and they're not going to resemble the tissue at that area. Um, they are erratically growing, which means we cannot produce predict that, they do whatever they want, and it's an uncontrolled growth pathway. As I said before, cells don't wear out. If they did, there wouldn't be tumors. They're just alive, and they keep dividing, and they do that as much as they want to, so they're immortal cells. 
So they can grow by expansion, meaning they can just get bigger, um, but they're also invasive, which means they can move around the tissue that they originated in. They can infiltrate other areas. We'll take a look at that in a second. And they can metastasize either by the bloodstream or lymphatic channels or both, because wherever you find one, you find the other. So here we are in the lungs. We've looked at the lining of the lungs before, and we've seen that there's epithelial cells. These are uh, squamous cells. Whenever I say that, I'm just going to write it down so you don't forget it. When I say squamous cells, squamous cells are on the lining of, of things. So the lining of your nasal cavity, your respiratory tract, uh, your GI tract, those are all squamous cells. So squamous cells, I'm going to use that term a lot, um, and you should know that if somebody has a squamous cell tumor, that it means that it arises from epithelial cells, because cells like this, they're squamous. Okay, so, all right, we'll get there. I'm getting ahead of myself. All right, so here we are in the respiratory tract. What you see are your squamous uh, respiratory epithelial cells. There's some goblet cells associated with these here, and then there's cilia to move the mucus in that clearance process. In every tissue, there is what we call a basement membrane where cell division happens. Because as you know, with respiratory cells, but even like your skin cells, if you put tape on your hand right now and took that piece off, on the tape would be a bunch of dead, worn out skin cells. And that's in the normal process. Where cells grow, they migrate upwards and they fill in for the cells that slough off and die in the natural process. So they should be moving in this way. So here, the cell division started at the basement membrane as we would expect, but you can see that they're moving down uh, lower to places like connective tissue, down to these submucosal areas, which is not good. So that's what we call invasion. So it is now invading the other levels of the tissue. So here we can see it getting bigger via expansion, but also starting to infiltrate uh, the other surrounding areas. So now it's down to the submucosal areas. Now we have this uh, one little cancerous cell formed in the epithelial process, uh, which has invaded now the submucosal areas, the uh, interstitial areas. You can see these crab-like extensions associated with it. And we can also see that as soon as it comes into contact with something that it can shed its cells off into, like in this case, here's a lymph channel. And in here, we have the, or the tumor shedding its cells into the blood stream. So that is how they can metastasize. It's very similar to those dandelion heads. So when a dandelion dies, you get that little puff ball and you blow it and it looks funny and those uh, seeds go all over and people take pictures of it and put it on their Instagram, and it's magic, right? And then one of those little seeds lands on the grass, and then you get a new dandelion, and then great, now there's lots of dandelions. Same thing with metastatic tumors. They grow, they shut off little pieces of themselves, like seeds, and if that thing, or if that cell finds a favorable location, it will land there, and it will do its very, very best to, uh, to grow. Okay, other things you'll see in malignant growth. So I mentioned this with the first um, illustration of a malignant tumor, that you do see fibrous uh, strands being utilized, um, but it's not to make a casing. It's to give this tumor some mass so that it can continue to grow. Uh, stroma is a term for layer. So this is a fibrous stroma, meaning that this malignant growth, uh, so we can actually see the borders of that here, uh, is allowing this tumor to become bigger. So it gives it some mass. So when uh, tumors get really big, they actually recruit the cells that make or spit out collagen, which wraps itself into spindles uh, to make eventually fibrin. And this adds to the density of the tumor, and it allows it to grow bigger. Um, again, if something is hard and non-mobile, it means that there's a lot of fibrin, and it also means that it is um, probably bad. 
Okay, the other uh, layers that we'll see uh, in malignant cells, in this case, this can be utilized as a way to treat tumors, is called the vascular stroma, so the blood vessel layers. When tumors are growing in the body, you need to think of them as an organ, and they need things that organs need. So they need energy, which they get by kind of taking glucose from the areas around it so they can run and make copies of their cells. And the other thing that an organ needs is its own blood supply. So as tumors start to grow, when they get about one millimeter in size, they can't just steal glucose and oxygen from uh, blood vessels via diffusion. They actually need their own vascularization. I mention this pretty much in every lecture. It's called VEGF, Vascular Endothelial Growth Factor. This is something that's secreted by ischemic tissues normally. So if there was an area of damage or an area of ischemia, so maybe there's an injury, the new cells that form in the healing process, they are ischemic essentially when they first get there. They don't, they're just kind of getting things from the surrounding environment, but what they really need is a blood supply so that they can live. So cells that are ischemic release VEGF. And VEGF is a chemical signal, and what it does is cause the budding of small little vessels to uh, start to grow out of existing vessels. So it encourages new vessel growth and brings it to that area. So as I mentioned, the tumors take advantage of normal body processes. And in these cases, this is just with healing. In healing, you get fibrin to seal up the area with scar tissue, and you also get blood vessels to revascularize that area. Tumors essentially act like a wound. They activate those same things so that they can grow larger. So VEGF, because it's a substance, we'll see that we can target VEGF release, which means we can arrest the size of the tumors, which is a really good outcome. But when they do get bigger than one millimeter, you will see that they physically secrete VEGF themselves and they cause their own vascularization. They get their own blood vessels so they can continue to grow bigger. And you will see in these malignant pictures that um, malignant growths, they are bloody, they are red, and they are highly vascularized. All right, so if you had to put into one word what the basis of cancer is, it's kind of here for you on this cell. If somebody needs to say in one sentence, describe cancer, you could say a cell that fails to undergo apoptosis. So as we learned in cellular injury, here's a normal mitosis process. The cell receives a growth factor because we need more of a cell. Maybe it's a skin cell, doesn't matter, we need one. So now that cell will undergo mitosis. It'll split into two identical daughter cells, identical to each other and identical to the parent. If there's an error, in that process. So there's, remember, a damaged nucleus means that that cell shouldn't be there. It needs to die. In normal cases, that cell puts out its little message and instigates apoptosis. So that caspase enzyme comes by and kills it. So now that cell's sacrificed itself for the good of the tissue, and we only have nice normal cells replicating. So in good cases, there's apoptosis. So simply at the very, very basic level, cancer is instigated when a cell becomes damaged and doesn't undergo normal apoptosis and it's not removed from the pool. And just like making copies of anything in the world, when you make a copy of something, it's not going to look normal. And the more times these cells split in each mutation, they're going to look less and less and less normal. And not only do they look less normal, but their genetics become highly abnormal also. So these multiple mutations means that you're going to have a tumor that not only is going to be big and bloody and spreading rapidly, but it's going to be filled with cells that absolutely do not resemble the tissue of origin, and they do not have the capabilities of that natural tissue of origin. Uh, they secrete really weird things. They grow on glucose. The more glucose there is, the bigger they can get, and the more blood supply there is to them, the bigger they get. So just uh, kind of 
wrapping up this basics talk. Uh, here's our normal growth. Again, I mentioned this basement cell layer. We call that basal, which means baseline or the lowest you can go, kind of like a basement. You shouldn't go any further than that. There is ground under there. This is where normal mitosis happens in the basal cell layer, or basement membrane. And then the cells divide and the cells migrate upwards. So here is like dermal tissue and here's your epidermis. And as I mentioned, we, we get skin cells dying every day. It's what we call a highly labile tissue. They pop off and that's a normal process. And they only migrate in one way. They don't go down here and they don't go over there. In cancerous growth, as we mentioned, this begins with one abnormality in these dividing cells, and that cell now doesn't remove itself from the pool. So it can copy itself. And now we start to have some abnormal copies in this area. We also see that these cells not only are becoming less and less normal looking, we're also seeing that they're invading this basal layer, which is something normal cells cannot do. Cancer cells actually secrete stuff that binds to these cells and just break it down so they can move right past it. And they do that to invade. Here's further invasion. We see now there's going up towards the top of the epidermis, the basal layer, the underdermal tissue. And once these cells get far enough and come into contact with something like a blood vessel, um, then they will definitely be happy to shut off some of the existing tumor cells so they can start growing this tumor. We want another one of those. So if that cell does land somewhere and start to grow, that's part of this original tumor. So when cancers spread to places like the brain or the lungs or the liver, it is the same tissue type. It's the same tumor just spreading itself around the body. And that's what we call metastasis. All right, as I mentioned, invasion is when there is metastatic growth going into a tissue layer that they did not originate from. It does this a couple of different ways. The first we've discussed, it's pressure atrophy. Uh, tumors have mass. They have all this fibrous material. So they can physically just get bigger and put pressure on the normal cells around them and break down their cytoskeletons, meaning they can inch a little bit more every time those kind of row of cells die due to pressure atrophy. Tumor cell motility. Tumor cells are highly motile. They move around a lot. They look like little bees buzzing, and you'll see that in the video that you'll uh, be shown in a little bit. Uh, so they buzz around, and they move all over the place, and they are more than happy to leave that tumor. Again, they have no loyalty to that tumor. They will go wherever they want to. They physically... Um, can bind to the extracellular matrix, or BM is uh, not bowel movement in this case, it's basement membrane where the cell division occurs. And these places, again, normal cells can't move past the basement membrane or extracellular matrix. So they just bind to those places and they just release um, catalytic enzymes so that they digest those things and move right past them. The other thing we saw a video of in a prior lecture, it's chemotaxis. Uh, just like normal white blood cells are attracted to a chemical to know where to move, tumor cells do that as well. So they follow chemical signals and will find the most suitable place for them by moving towards those things. All right, I'm just seeing how much more. All right. Okay, so I'm going to show you this video very quickly. And that is good because it'll give me a chance to... Take a Spread break. of tumors to distant locations is of great importance in cancer. About 90% of the deaths due to cancer involve tumors that have spread around the body. The movement of tumor cells to other parts of the body is known as metastasis. Metastasis is a complex process during which cancer cells break off of the original or primary tumor and move through the body to form tumors at new locations. From the point of view of a cancer cell, this is a dangerous and often unsuccessful process. 
A trip through the body is full of hazards that cause the death of most cells that begin the journey, even tough cancer cells. To begin the process, individual cells must break away from the tumor and invade nearby vessels. The cells crawl along the surface of other cells and the fibrous, stringy structure surrounding them and then force their way in. Shown here is the invasion of the blood supply. Once inside a blood vessel, the cancer cells may perish from a variety of causes. Some cells die simply because they are unable to survive floating around in the bloodstream. Others may become damaged and die when they squeeze through tight spaces or bump into the walls of the blood vessels. Still other migrating cells may be recognized and destroyed by cells of the immune system. How and where the migrating cells stop is different for different cancer types. Once the tumor cells are no longer moving, they can begin the process of forming a new tumor by leaving the blood vessel and beginning to reproduce in the new location. This does not always occur, and cells that have made it this far may still die or fail to divide. If the new environment is suitable, the newly arrived cell will begin to grow and a new tumor will develop. All right, let's give them a like. Good job, YouTube. All right, so that is, <coughs> excuse me, the process of metastasis. The cells break off and then they move around the body. Wherever they originated from is called the primary site. Anywhere else that they land and start growing is called a secondary site. They can have multiple secondary sites, um, again, that's where we get into staging and grading of tumors, but those are secondary sites. What you can do uh, to apply your physiology and anatomy knowledge is actually predict where tumors will go. So here we have a metastatic growth in the breast. And if we think about what's closest to the breast and what drains the breast, which is how you know that there's an infection in the breast, is the axillary lymph nodes in the armpit area. Whenever those are swollen, it means that something has gotten into them, either a pathogen uh, in an infection, um, or it could be malignant cells. So that's the first thing in line. And again, wherever you find uh, lymphatic channels, you also find blood vessels next to them. But the lymph system in general eventually empties into the subclavian vein so that it can move through the bloodstream and be uh, excreted from the body by the kidneys if it's something we don't want in there or utilized if it's something that we do. Not just garbage goes through the lymph uh, channels, but proteins go through there and fluids and all kinds of things. So it empties into the subclavian veins and then goes through the vena cava system, the heart, and then ends up in the lungs. This is the pulmonary arterial system, meaning lungs plus arteries. Everything in your body, um, besides the GI tract, which we'll get to in a second, is utilizing the pulmonary arterial system because blood needs to go to the heart and the lungs to be oxygenated and then pumped out to the body. So if you see the pulmonary arterial system involved in a malignant growth metastasis, you'll see that the most common secondary site is the lungs. And if you think about the anatomy of the lungs, it's the largest capillary bed in the body. These are very low resistance capillaries, meaning it's easy to get things through them. And they're also really tiny. They spread around each alveoli. So when cancerous cells end up there, uh, they find a really nice place to grow. So very common secondary site for pulmonary arterial system um, advantage, <laughs> advantageous <laughs> tumors. If though, it is a malignant growth associated with the portal system, 
So remember the hepatic portal vein is what drains the GI tract. So it can shunt up oxygen and dissolve nutrients and all this good stuff to the liver. And the liver gets a huge amount of its um, oxygen from this portal vein. And the word portal kind of means it's going in the opposite direction. So usually when you think about a vein, you don't think of it having a lot of oxygen in it, but the portal vein uh, it has a ton of it. But when a malignant growth takes advantage of this system, all those things are shunted up to the liver. And the liver has very leaky capillaries in it. They're called sinusoidal capillaries. And they're also very fine and very small and pretty low resistance uh, unless there's some sort of uh, liver disease. So when malignant cells get to those, they can start growing there. So in the United States, it's very uncommon to see primary tumors of the liver, but it is very, very common to see secondary uh, tumors go to the liver. Um, colon cancer is one of the top three cancers in the United States. Um, for males, it's prostate is number one. For females, it's breast. Number two is lung. And number three is colon or GI tract. Um, one, two, three. So because this is the third most common type of cancer, you can expect when there's a malignant growth in the colon that the liver would be the most common secondary site. So we call that a metastatic tumor. It didn't start growing there, but it ended up there and now there's liver cancer. When the liver becomes affected, that is very dangerous. If we look here at the anatomy again, there's the ascending vena cava right behind it. And when that tumor puts pressure on it, uh, eventually it just cuts off blood flow through the vena cava and the blood pressure drops and death is imminent. So it's a very quick um, process, unfortunately, when the liver is affected. So we call this whole process that I just described, it's all written out for you here, so you didn't have to write down every single thing that I said, but if you did, that's good for you. We know it increases retention. It, that's called metastasis by embolism. An embolus, just to define it for you, because I use this term a lot and you should too, an embolus is really anything in the bloodstream that's not a blood cell. So it's anything foreign in blood. So when a clot breaks off, that's an embolus. So embolism is the act of an embolus moving through the bloodstream. So metastasis by embolism is a mass of things, in this case, cancer cells moving uh, as a unit through the bloodstream. And they're an embolus because they're foreign. We should have red blood cells in there, not cancerous cells. Again, the other ways that uh, metastatic cells can move around the body and metastasize is through the lymph channels. So if we just want to go through this, which is written out for you here, so don't ignore that. Um, tumor invasion of lymphatic vessel, meaning once the tumor gets to the lymph vessel, it embolizes to the regional lymph nodes. And typically you see the tumor cells starting to grow there because lymph nodes are also very leaky, uh, very, very leaky capillaries and really low rate of flow. So it's easy for things to grow in them. So once there is a growth of tumor cells in a lymph node, there's a couple of ways that they can move on. Uh, again, wherever you find a lymph channel, you find a blood vessel right by, meaning it can just take the highway of the blood cell and then go to more distant sites. So typically local invasion um, of local lymph nodes is early in the process. The other thing that it can do once it gets to the local lymph node, so if this was breast cancer, it could be the axillary lymph node that we looked at in the picture prior. It can grow so big that it blocks lymph flow in that area um, so that now we have a very leaky lymph channel and things are just <laughs> like leaking out of it. Um, 
which might open up the ability for other lymphatic channels in the surrounding areas to pick up those metastatic cells. So it can make its way to other lymphatic channels by just blocking flow through uh, like that lymph node, for example. The other thing it can do when it's growing in the lymph node is further embolization, um, which essentially is just when it becomes trapped and can colonize the other lymph nodes in that area. Um, so essentially then you have um, a small secondary site. So I'm going to put up, um, before I get to the more clinical aspects of these tumors and how we name them uh, right on canvas right now. I will put up um, the review handouts. These are given out by the American Cancer Society. So they're written in layman's terms for patients to understand. And it describes the staging and grading methodology that's used um, to characterize tumor types. Um, so definitely take a look at that. And we'll be back in a little bit to talk about uh, the naming of things and get into the different types of metastatic growth. Okay.